Okay, good. Let's get to the Word. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Your assignment today is, uh, homework today is reading that entire chapter. I'm only going to read the first two uh, scriptures in Numbers 13, then we'll get going today. Numbers 13 says this, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the Bible. Lord, we thank you that it is revelation. It is nourishment. God, it is food for our soul. God, it does not need any help from me. It can preach all by itself. And so, Father, would you take this word, divide it as you see fit, place it into the lives of people where they're living, that we would walk out of this place differently today, that we would leave this place changed today by the power of your word and by the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name I ask it. And everybody says, amen. If you're taking notes, I've tagged the title today, I Spy Something Good. I Spy Something Good. I want to try to set this story up. It was, it was the background of the story that the prophet, uh, that, that the people of Israel had been, it had been slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. And Moses gets up and basically is rallying his people and saying, hey, listen, we have stayed here long enough at this mountain. It's time. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, he says, let's break camp and let's advance. In other words, God had revealed to him that, that there was a promise that had been given to the children of Israel. It was a, a, a land that, that he was giving them, a Can- the land of Canaan that, that he was that he was giving God, God's people. And so God sent Moses with this message to tell the people basically that he had a future uh, that that was better than their present, that he had future plans for them, that that was something that was far better than their current situation, that what was ahead was better than where they were. Like he, that, that was better than slavery, that was better than poverty, that was better than where they currently were living. Like God was trying to get Moses to tell the people that, hey, listen, I know you think this is good, but I'm t- I want you to tell the people that I've got something better. I've come to remind you today that God has something better for you as an individual. He's got something better for your family. He's got something better for your marriage. He's got something better for your future. And not only does he have something better for you individually, come on, I'm also preaching. He has something better for us corporately as a church. That, there is a, there, that there's a place of promise, that there is a, a place in the land of possibility, that there is a place that, that, that we can actually pioneer in, a place where we can become landowners in, a place where we can, we can own our own home, and a place where we can dream big dreams. I, I, I guess I'm trying to ask, is there anybody that has ever come to the understanding or the question that your current condition may not be your, your future destination? Like, you, you, know, like you, you know, you may be currently battling depression, but, but depression is not your final destination. Like you might be in a current valley of, of, of struggle, but how many people know your future is not in the current valley of struggle? You may have walked in battling depression, but your future is not one of depression. You may have walked in with an addiction, but your future is not one of an addiction. You may, you may have walked in and thought you were never, you were way too far gone, but how many people know that's not what your future is in God? And so you have to come to the realization that your current condition may not be your permanent location, that there is something greater for you. Like God has something bigger. God has something better. Like there, there's something on the other end of this current, current season that there's, a, that there's a better place, there's a greater place, there's a larger place. That where we are even today physically as a church, I've just got this in my heart that, that even where we are right now, like this is not going to be where we finish. Like there's something better. Like God's got greater plans. God's got a better place. And like I don't know if you feel the way that I feel, but like where we are, where, where we are right now will not be where we finish. Like God's got something better. God's got something brighter. God's got something, God's got something way, way better than where we currently are today. Like where we are right now, where you are right now does not have to be where we finish. But yet we have this opportunity, this possibility, come on, to go and possess a land that has not been possessed. We got an opportunity to step into a promised land, to a place where where God, I believe, has already given us the land to inhabit. Are you with me? Trying to preach faith into the room today. Like doesn't have to be, like we we don't, where you are today in your life does not have to be where you finish. Like what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, how you're living, 
does not have to be how you finish. And just as it is with you, also is with our church. We don't always have to be crammed in this room. We don't always have to fight parking. We don't always have to fight a small kids ministry. We don't always have to fight all these things that we're currently fighting, but God is giving us the opportunity, come on, to explore a land, to take a land that is bigger, that is better, and that possesses something great for our future. And so I came today with a word, not only for you individually, but also for our church, that this word speaks of a better place. This word speaks of a better land, of a greater opportunity. But with a word that speaks of a greater opportunity, it will always require people and great work from me and from you. In other words, great opportunity comes on the back of great hard work. So I kind of want to rally around these three things we're going to unpack and I'll let you go today. Number one, see it. Number two, say it. And number three, possess it. See it, say it, possess it. My wife likes alliteration, so for her, see it, say it, seize it. See it, say it, seize it. And before I want to jump into seeing it, I want to, I want to lay the groundwork. I've heard, I've heard this thing come around, and I want to make sure that I, I, that, that, that I expose this lie. There's one lie that you and I can't afford to listen to and or believe about this thing that we're entering, entering into. I've already heard it said. I've heard people say it. I've heard people tweet it. I've heard people message it. And it goes along. This is a lie. Are you ready for it? If God wants us to have it, then we won't have to fight for it. It's a lie. Well, if God has given us the land, then we ain't going to have to fight for it. Lie. Can I tell you individually, if God, and he wants you to be free, but how many people know you've got to fight for that freedom? Like, it's one thing to get set free. It's a whole nother thing to live in freedom. Like, you don't think God wants you to be blessed and highly favored? No, no, no. He wants us to be blessed and highly favored, but how many people know it don't just come naturally? You've got to fight for it. Like, you got to sow, you got to give faithfully, time in and time out, week in and week out. And so, just like individually, is, is, so is it corporately. That we, we cannot sit back and say, well, hey, God's made this all possible. We don't got to do nothing. And God's going to give it to us. That is a bold-faced lie. You don't think there is obstacle after obstacle that the enemy has already put in front of us to try to stop us from getting to that land? So you think we can just show up and... Well, God, preacher, God said you can have the land. It's ours. We don't need to do anything. No, no, that, that is a lie. Why do you think we're doing 21-day prayer journey as a church? Because we need to be unified. We need everybody to pray. Well, I'm not partaking in it. Why aren't you partaking in the 21-day prayer journey? It takes less than 60 seconds of your time every day. Because we can have the idea... Well, hey, God's already made it this way. God's going to take care of the rest. No, no God, has, God has positioned us, has given us this, this dream, this, this land, this building, and said, this is the land. This is the promised land. But make no mistake about it. We will have to fight for it. Do you think we won't find a fight after a fight from the pit of hell to try to stop this church from taking over that property? You don't think it's, you think it's just going to be awesome and the waters are going to part and there's no faith required? No, no. There will be giant after giant after giant to try to discourage these, this people and this church from giving up before we inherit that promised land. And so just because God has given us the land doesn't mean that it's going to come without a fight. No, it's going to come with a fight. It's going to come with audacious faith. It's going to come with radical faith. It's not going to come because we get together and say, well, hey, God's going to give the resource. The last time I checked, money don't grow on trees. I've planted money trees, and they don't produce fruit. The only way we get to the land, come on, are you with me today? Like, it's through radical sacrifice and radical generosity. Like, that's the only way we get there. And so to think that it's going to be a fun journey, it will be an amazing journey together. But it's going to be a hard one too. And you don't think I've been up at night wondering who's going to fall off the ship, who's going to jump off the ship because the weight's going to be too strong. There will, there will, there will be no doubt people that check out during this journey. But then there will also be people who join the journey. 
And so to think this journey is going to be fun and it's going to be easy, no, it's going to be hard. It's going to be stressful. You're going to get tired of hearing me talk about money. But you have to understand this, that that land represents way more than just a building. It represents a hospital for sick people. It represents a place where people can find freedom in one step, not 12. It represents a place where people's marriages can be restored and families can be saved and children can be taught the truth about their gender and about their sexuality and about their future. We can have this place where we actually have a beacon of hope for all of our city and our region. But to think that, to think that, that, that will God's given it to us. We don't have to fight for it. No, it's going gonna, it's gonna to t- take 21 days of prayer and then some. It's going to take some people popping up a tent down there and sleeping and walking around the property and making sure we keep that covered with the blood of Christ and we keep speaking faith over. It's going to take radical faith. It's going to take them more than just, hey, a one-day fast for our church. No, it's going to take radical faith. It's going to take radical steps to make sure that we inherit the promise that God has already given us. And so don't buy into the lie that just because God's given it to us doesn't mean we'll have to fight for it. Because if that was the case, then the children of Israel would not have wandered around the wilderness for 40 years after God had given them the promised land. God had already given, if you reread it right there in Numbers 13, that he had given them Canaan. All they had to do was see it, speak it, and seize it. That they, he, had, he had already prepared it. It wasn't, hey, they don't have to pay for it like we do. He had already given them Canaan. The promised land, a land that flowed with milk and honey and had grapes and had all of the things that they were desiring. All they had to do was possess it. They had the same mentality that some of us have is that, well, hey, God's given it. We ain't got to fight for it. And they found themselves wandering around the, around the wilderness for 40 years because they weren't willing to fight giants that were in the land. Come on, you think it's going to be easy? It's going to be hard. But can I, can I, can I tell you with the spirit of Caleb, but we are well able to take that land. Will there be giants? Yes. But God created giants to fall. And every giant we slay will build a memorial right there that reminds us of the faithfulness of God along the way. Come on, I'm talking about we are well able to take the land. And so I came with great encouraging news. I'm not, I'm not being negative. I'm not being pessimistic. I'm not being down. I've came with great news. I've came with great encouraging news that we are, look around, we are well able to possess the land. God gave us a glimpse last week at just what our church looks like when we all come together in one roof. Do you realize how many people we jammed in three services last week? We were approaching 2,000 people on the weekend in this little room. And I've come to tell you, God's given us a glimpse of just what might take place a few short miles down the road. And so I came with good news that the opportunity has been given by God to us. That we get the opportunity, that we get the chance, come on, that God is writing the story of our church. How cool is it that we get to be the part in making this next chapter of our church come to life? Like 40, 50 years down the road, people will be seated in that room talking about these people that made it possible for them to worship God. Like, I want us to think bigger than just currently. I'm talking about 50 years when my son's preaching and Dakota's son is leading worship and the children of my son's having is in the kids' ministry and your grandkids are in kids' ministry. We get a chance to be the ones that they talked about. It's got to be bigger than where we currently are. Please understand, like, like we're building a church not just for me to go preach into and you to come. We're building a church for generations after we are long and gone. To still be worshiping God with the idea of changing a city and impacting a region. Like, do you understand the level that we get to buy in? We are foundation, baby. We are the crazy people that had enough faith to take a land that was filled with giants and a hundred reasons why we shouldn't, but about one reason why we should, because the lost people that are far from God that need radically saved, I feel the Holy Spirit on my life right now. We are called to be the ones, come on, they get to make it possible. Do you understand the generational impact that we get to make? 
It's not that did God give us the land. No, God has already given us the opportunity to possess the land. The question is, do we have enough faith to see it, to speak it, and to possess it? I love this idea because here, 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 here Moses sends 12 spies. They had to see it. Like I, I love this idea of seeing it. What is that rendering out on the TV in the lobby? It is a picture. It's a picture. We get to see it. Not all the millions of people got to see the promised land. Moses sent 12 spies in. Out of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of leaders he could have chose, he chose 12 spies to go see it. We actually get a look at the picture of the future. Proverbs 29 says, without vision, people perish. Why do we need a rendering? Because I need you to have a picture. It's not a pipe dream. It's a picture. It's what it's going to look like. It's where we're going. i got to get you to see it. Many of you have been on the property, and you've taken selfies, and you prayed, and I love all of it. We've got to be able to see the parking lot, not with potholes. Everybody knows the parking lot has potholes. But I don't see the parking lot with potholes. Like when I drive on the parking lot, I see pavement, fresh pavement, filled with people and filled with kids and Judah the lion and his new cups that he has and he's hugging people and there's an atmosphere of expectation and thousands of people are coming. I see full rooms and full owners and full kids ministry. I got to get you to see it. Yeah, we have multiple ways in and multiple ways out. I don't see, I, I don't see an empty park. I see traffic problems there. And as long as we have traffic problems, that's a sign God is moving. The day you don't have to wait to get out of the parking lot means we are dying as a church. I don't just pray that one place is filled, but I pray all four exits are filled with cars coming and cars going. That's what I see. Like, I got to get you to see it. It's what the rendering's for. Because anybody can pull up on that lot now and say, man, hey, that building needs a lot of work. Yeah, that's why it's set vacant for 12 years, because nobody has vision. I don't, see an, I, don't, I don't see an empty building. I don't see a lot of wasted space. No, I see state-of-the-art kids ministry where hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids come and volunteers who love kids so much that they spend their whole week preparing the message so they can tell the kids about Jesus. I see a kids ministry that, that is not just a kids' ministry, but it is a conduit for the kingdom of God. And we take kids' ministry into our youth ministry. And I don't just see a hundred youth. I see hundreds upon hundreds, if not thousands of youth gathered on the weekend and gathered on the weekday that helps build the kingdom of God that sets our church up for success. I just come to tell you, I need you to see what I see. And, and just like the 12 spies, we, we too sent spies into the land. Pastor John, take Mike Litton, take Randy Williams. I want you to go into the land and spy out what you see and bring me back a good report. The thing that I love about this current season that we're in and, and the possibility that lies ahead is, is you too get to go to the land. That you can actually go step foot on the promised land, the land of Canaan. Standing on what will be, I believe, the greatest move of God this city and region has ever seen. I just ask you, what do you see? Do you see it? Do you see the potential? Do you see the reach? Do you see all the people coming? Or do you, are you too obstructed with the giants that stand in the way? Because I, 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 I see, I see giants but I see them laying on their back dead as I step over them and I go to the next one and we go to the next one. I'm trying to help you see it. See, some of you just see a big building. No, no, no. No, it is a gigantic building. But it's, but it, it's way more than a building. It's, it's a place that you understand, used to be an old Lowe's building that was all about home improvement. You know what I see again? Open for business. 
the Warehouse Church is back in the home improvement business. Where, 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 we, where we teach marriages how to love one another. We teach moms and dads how to be great parents. Come on, that we love the next generation. I just want you, church, to see what I've been seeing. Because if we can see it, it'll change what we say. And a lot of the problem that we have is we don't, we don't see the promise. We don't, we, don't, we don't see the possibility. But yet we see the land full of giants and... I just come to tell you that I don't see ourselves broke. Here's what you got to speak over yourself for your own life, for your own situation. Because you're not careful. You, 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 we, we have a tendency to be our own worst enemy by the words that we speak. God can give us the vision. That's why as a church we have to agree corporately today that we will let no negativity touch our lips. I don't care if you're fearful. I don't care if you don't like it. I don't care if you think we should have got somewhere else. If you are negative, keep it to yourself. Why? Because what you say has the potential to shape our future. And so we got to make sure that we are saying the same thing, that we may not know how God's going to do it, but we know God is going to do it. We don't know how he's going to do it, but we know he is going to do it. we got to make sure that we not only see it, come on, but we say it. Like, you got to be over your life. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't see myself addicted. I don't see myself falling short. I don't see myself as a mess up. I don't see myself as a failure. I don't see bad. I don't see depression. I don't see anxiety. I don't see me popping pills. I don't see me struggling. I don't see me hopeless. I, I don't see me being finished yet. Come on. We got to learn to say things over life. I mean, I see myself blessed. I see myself highly favored. I see goodness chasing me. I see mercy chasing me. I see God that's making a way. And if all you ever do is see bad, all the giants, all the bad reports, keep them to yourself. We know there'll be bad reports. We know that there'll be giants. But anything worth something like that is going to come at a cost in a battle. Like, we have to know that, man, whatever it takes to get our feet in that promised land, to open up those doors to a city and a region, we have to be willing to do whatever it takes to make that possible. Yep. Giant. It, you know, anybody can give us bad news. You don't have to be... A, you, bad news comes natural to people. Well, preacher, did, did you see the sidewalk? It's crumbling. Yeah, I did. But did you see the new concrete that we poured? No, you don't. Because anybody can be negative. Well, it's going to take a lot of money to pay for that parking lot. Well, do you know God is able? Yeah. Do you know that I got Robbie Evans in my hip pocket if he's watching online or on TV? I'm calling Robbie this week. Do you know? Don't always see the negative. Well, that's going to be a lot. Of, we got a lot. Of, how are we going to pay the heating and bill? Do you know who God is? Always, you're pointing out the obvious negative things. Keep them to yourself. Yeah. Like, what ifs? Fear. I'm scared. Well, but. I mean, we might, we might be able to do it, but what? Keep your butt to yourself. <laughs> Keep your butts covered. We don't want to hear it. But how about, yeah, it, there may be giants, but, but God is able. Yeah, it might be hard, but God is faithful. It may take a lot of resource, but God is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Come on, my Bible says that I'm blessed in the city and I'm blessed in the field, that I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread, but he's always making a way. And he that began the good work in me will be faithful to finish it. That's what my Bible says. That's what I choose to stand on. One of my favorite scriptures, if God is for me, who can be against me? I came to serve notice to hell that if God is for us, then who can be against us? That if God has brought us this far, he's going to be faithful to get us across the finish line. That, come on, I'm just telling you, we got to, we got to speak faith. We got to rally in faith. Do I got anybody with me today? And so Numbers 13, Numbers 13. Moses sent 12 spies, gathered 12, 12 spies and sent them into the land. And he said, hey, I want you to take pictures. I want you to bring back a good report. Hey, if there's fruit in the land, bring, bring me back some fruit so that I can see what that, land is, what that land is like. And so Moses sends out 12 spies. And 
the 12 spies, they, they all go into the land. It's supposed to be an 11-day journey. They end up spending 40 days in the land of Canaan. 11-day journey, they spent 40 I love the fact that these 12 spies, like they, they, had, they had seen all of God's faithfulness. They had seen all the things that God has done. But the fact that Moses had to send the 12 spies into the land of Canaan was to make sure that God was good on what God said. In other words, the only reason they went to the land of Canaan was to make sure God was actually telling the truth. How crazy do you got to be? You're part of the people of God that God had brought out of 400 years of slavery. They walked through parted waters. They watched the Egyptian army drowned. They had taken place in a miraculously guided journey through the wilderness. They had seen promise of the land flowing with milk and honey. They saw miracle after miracle after miracle. They saw Moses strike a rock in the desert that fed all the, pe that, that, that fed all the people. They saw miracle after miracle. But yet when God gave them the promise, they said, now we've got to make sure God's telling the truth. Moses said, I'll send 12 people. 12 spies go in. It's supposed to be 11 days. They come out after 40 after 40 days, they returned to Moses with evidence. It's one thing to return with a report, but when you return with evidence, evidence trumps words. What's the Bible say in Numbers 13, 27, that we went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey, and then here is the fruit. They had grapes so big that one cluster of grapes hung on a pole between two men carrying the grape. How big were the grapes? That two grown men, you go to a Sam's Club and get the carton of grapes, you can carry it in one hand. But these grapes in the promised land, come on, were so big, so amazing, that it took two grown men to carry one cluster of grapes back to Moses. Twelve spies went into the land. Grapes the size of basketballs, gallons of milk, buckets of honey. They came back and said, all twelve spies reported the same. I grew up in church, raised in church. I was studying these last few weeks preparing this sermon. And I had never seen this before. I always thought that the ten negative spies had nothing but negative things to say. And then the two positive, Joshua and Caleb, were the only ones that said positive things. That's not, the, that's not the truth. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says that all 12 came back and gave the report that they walked on the ground. They saw the promise. They saw the fruit of the land. They were overcome with a feeling that God had actually provided for them. And they were given the opportunity. They all said that we are given the opportunity to take the land. In other words, the land was good. The land was fertile. It is good ground. There are grapes the size of basketballs. It is an unbelievable place. All 12 spies said it was a good land. All 12 spies said that the land flowed with milk and honey. All 12 said God hooked us up, Moses. All 12 said that, man, the land is a blessing. All 12 said the land was full of promise. All 12 knew that the land was exactly what God had promised a generation after generation. But even after all 12 said all of that, only two said we could take it. Ten said, hey, the land is awesome, the land is great, the land is fertile, it's amazing, it's got potential, it's humongous, lots of parking spaces, lots of rooms, amazing opportunity to come, amazing opportunity to take it. The land is amazing, but only two said we are well able to take the land. All twelve saw it, only two said we could possess it. Joshua and Caleb standing there with the 10 negative spies. The 10 negative spies are giving the report and all their report is negative. There are giants in the land. They are big. They are powerful. Four million dollars, how can we raise that? That is a big thing. I'm scared to death. That is a big giant. The people were all negative. And just like today's culture, so was it in the days of Moses, that negativity was attractive to people. Negativity attracted negativity. They're giving this bad report that, man, these, the land is it's, it's awesome, but it's got giants. Do you understand? They were carrying grapes. 
talking about giants. Carrying evidence of the promise of God, talking about giants. Ten spies said, well, we're, we're like grasshoppers in our own sight. Read the scripture. Nobody called them grasshoppers, but that's how they viewed themselves. We're inferior, we're small. How is this Parkersburg, Pastor? How do you expect us to raise that kind of money miraculously? We're grasshoppers. We're, we can't raise that much money. Why can't we go somewhere cheaper? Why we got to do that all the time? Why you always got to take offerings? And all the while, the negativity was whirling and people were attracted. Kayla interrupts and says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yes, I saw the giants and yes, I know it's not going to be easy. But look around, we are well able to possess the land. We are well positioned to possess the land. Not only did they see it, Caleb knew he had to say it. We have to learn as a church to say it. In our, in our speech has to be one of faith. Unified. Unified speech. I don't know how God's going to do it. I, I go to sleep every night thinking how in the world, what in the world have you got myself into? If I'm honest, I'm I wrote a whole other chapter of my life where this thing falls flat and I go sell cars for a living in another state. I'm being very transparent with you. But I do know this, that we are well able to possess the land. Not only do we have to see it, not only is it important to say it, but then thirdly, we have to be willing to possess it, to seize it. We can't just take it. I'll go to jail. <laughs> but in a few weeks, on Miracle Sunday, when we all sacrificially give and commit for three years above and beyond our tithes, that's our chance of possession. That's our chance to see the buy-in. What's it, well, what is it worth to you? What, what is it worth? Is it worth sowing a seed so radical that you put your family's name on it? What's it worth to you? See, the danger is we have small-minded thinking that some of the questions come up and say, man, I can't wait to get in that building so we can have one service. No, no, we're never going to have one service. We're not getting a bigger room so we can fill it once. What, right? Like that's small-minded thinking. The moment we settle for one service, we're telling God to stop reaching. No, no, we're, we're going to launch that baby with two services, believing that we'll have to go to three, believing we'll have to go to four, believing we'll have to open up another campus. Why? Because as long as I've got la la uh, air in my lungs and blood in my veins, and as long as there's one more person that does not know God, our doors have to remain open. And so we have to learn to get a radical faith to not only see it, to not only say it, but to seize it. And all I'm asking for is to ask God how you can play a part to write the next story of our church. Come on, we're not only going to change the city. Come on, we're going to impact a region. I don't know about you, but I'm done today. I spy something good. Come on, I spy a full room. I spy a, I spy a place where people drive for hours to get on the lot. I spy a place where revival, it breaks out. I spy someplace good. It's a good land. It's got good, good soil. It's got massive potential. Come on, we got to see it. Do you see it? Yes. Come on, you can, I can close my eyes and see it. I can, I can see it. We got to learn to say it. God, I trust in you. Got to learn it. We got to learn to say it. We got to see it in faith. We got to speak it when it don't make sense. And then, then, then the hardest part that we got to get over as a church family we got to possess it by giving a resource. 
every level every level matters don't you dare let the devil talk you out of giving a twenty dollar gift because you don't think it matters it matters to whom much is given much is required there'll be some people that write a really really big check and think it's awesome and guess what God is no more pleased with them than a person that was able to give a dollar fifty in the offering bucket it's not equal giving equal sacrifice but together corporately can I just can, I, can we just have a little, little gathering right here can, can we just get honest if we all rally and we all do our part we're going to get to that land but if you sit back and think the other person's going to get us there we'll be sitting here for another 40 years waiting the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of the opportunity